Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Therese Curran, and I am the Regional Education Advisor for NRC in the Middle East, and it is my very great pleasure on behalf of all of our fantastic colleagues from the secondary, Global Secondary Education Working Group uh, to come here today to have this wonderful afternoon where we get the opportunity to launch our very new secondary education in emergency page on the INEE website. So thanks so very much for joining us all today. 198. 198 million adolescents of lower and upper secondary school age are out of school today, this minute, across the world. 61 million are lower secondary age. 138 million are of upper secondary school age. In crisis affected contexts where many of us work, among adolescents aged 10 to 19, 54% reach lower secondary school, compared to in other context, 80%. 27% reach upper secondary school, compared to their peers in other contexts where there's 50% of their peers in non-emergency contexts go to upper secondary school. Adolescent girls in contact zones are 90% less, or 90% more likely to be out of school than girls in non-conflict settings. For refugees in particular, Growth enrollment rate of secondary level is far lower in comparison to enrollment for secondary school age children worldwide. Now that's a lot of numbers, but as we begin our webinar tonight, today, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to invite you all to take a moment. I'd like to ask you to remember the name of just one young person you know who you've met who's one of the 73% of young people who've never made it to upper secondary school. Maybe they're a young person you met in a context where you've worked. Maybe they're a young person you've met in a community where you live today. What is their name? And what is their story? For every one of them has a name. Every one of them has a story. I ask you to remember them today throughout this webinar. For me, her name is Hiba, and she is a refugee living in northeast Syria. For me, she is the reason we are here today. So welcome, everybody, and thank you so very much for joining us. Today, we will be joined by a number of panelists who will be sharing with us the importance of secondary education the role of the Global Secondary Education Working Group and introducing you to our new page on the INE website. And finally, hearing about one of the resources being shared on that new website page, a recent landscape review entitled Learning Outcomes for Adolescents in Fragile Context. So first of all, before we begin, we are indeed going to hear from a young person because that's what this is all about. It's not about us, it's about them. It's about their future, their visions, their hopes. So today we're going to begin by introducing you to one inspiring young woman who against all odds has graduated from secondary school in Kakuma Refugee Camp in Kenya. So introducing you to Alec. Alec, you are very welcome. Hello everyone, my name is Alec Deng Manyok. Uh, I'm a South Sudanese by nationality. I'm 19 years old. I'm a refugee in Kakuma refugee and uh, refugee camp. Uh, and uh, I recently uh, graduated from high school that is in Kakuma refugee secondary school. It's a school in the camp. And believe me, it's not been an easy journey because uh, there have been setbacks and there have been tantrums being thrown about girl child education. But I'm here to tell you today that uh, we're changing the narrative for good because as long as you have goals and ambitions that you have to achieve then believe me there's nothing that's that's going to stop you from reaching towards them currently i am doing i'm pursuing software engineering in kca university and it it has been my dream my dream course and and i'm so happy that i 
I did everything within my power to to reach to that level. And uh, another thing I'd like to say is that uh, as long as you have a goal and as long as you have the right the right support and the right mentality, then believe me, uh, you're going to achieve what you want. Then uh, another thing I'd like to add on is that uh, I want to encourage my fellow my fellow friends and girls in the camp that everything is possible. Nobody should tell you that, uh, no, you should not do this. This is not meant for you. This is not meant for you. No, that's not how we do things here. It's the right time we, we, we show the society what you're made of. Because I believe if everyone is given a chance to do what they do best, then believe me, we're going to be having a very great society of, ahead of us. Sincere thanks to Transform Education for connecting us with Alec. I'm sure you all agree what a fabulous young woman she is. And thank you, Transform Education, for supporting her to share her message today. As Alec said, as long as you have a goal, everything is possible. And best of all, I loved what she said. It is the right time to show society what we are made of. And Alec is certainly doing that. Alec is certainly someone we need to watch. So moving into the next part of our webinar, we're going to now talk about secondary education and an overview of the current trends and gaps. So we welcome Clara Van Prague, who is a senior education officer working in UNHCR Regional Bureau for Eastern and Horn of Africa. Clara, your region hosts approximately 5 million refugees and 12 million IDPs. Can you give us an overview what are the current trends regarding secondary education for forcibly displaced people in your region? Why access to secondary education is so important for them? And what would be needed to address existing challenges? You are very warmly welcome, Clara. Over to you. Thanks, Therese. Um, yeah, big questions that I think uh, we've all been grappling with, particularly around what can we do. Um, but to start with some of the trends, so access to quality secondary education is definitely a global challenge, as you outlined um, in a lot of the statistics you gave. Uh, but for adolescents and young people living in emergency and protracted crisis contexts, the situation is even more difficult. Uh, we just heard from Alec how challenging it was for her to graduate from secondary school and gain access to university, but also how important it was for her and all the girls that she represents to achieve this. So for refugees, the growth rate at secondary level is far lower um, in comparison to enrollment rates for secondary school age children worldwide. We can see on the graph it's about 34% globally um, and for school age children worldwide it's about 84%. And if we look at a few of the stats from countries in my region, we can already see that at the primary school level we are already at a disadvantage. Um, and even in countries such as Kenya where we've got like a 99% uh, um, uh, uh, gross enrollment uh, rate uh, for secondary school, when we jump to secondary, uh, sorry, for primary school, when we jump to secondary, it drops to 51%. So it means that we have a massive, uh, um, like almost 50% of students that do not make that transition into secondary. And so when we're looking at a country like Sudan, where the gross enrollment rate is 57% at primary, it drops to as low as 6% when we reach secondary. So even though we say this global statistic of 34% of refugee children are enrolled, it varies so significantly country by country, um, you know, where it can be as low as 6%. Or in countries where we're doing relatively well, it still only reaches 51%. Um, and there are various reasons for this. Like secondary education costs three to five times more than primary education for national ministries of education. And so given this relatively significant cost increase, it's not surprising to see this big gap uh, between uh, access to secondary education for refugees and, non and displaced children. Uh, many of the countries in Eastern Horn of Africa struggle to provide access 
access to secondary school for their nationals. And so places for refugee students are even more limited. And even in situations where secondary school might be subsidized, there are still high costs associated uh, with additional expenses such as uniforms, textbooks, food, transport to school, etc. We also have to think about the education sector plans and budgets, which are not always inclusive of refugees. And so if refugees uh, and displaced students are not planned or budgeted for, it's very difficult to ensure that they're included within the national system. Education sector plans and policies need to be gender and disability sensitive to ensure we're promoting equal access for all children. In low income environments, which is also a typical characterization of many refugee settlements in camps, it's extremely challenging to justify the cost of staying in school, um, even for those who make the transition initially. So the pandemic showed us that many school aged youth were able to earn small incomes for their families while schools were still closed. So once schools reopened, families really had to assess the opportunity cost of sending adolescents back to school when they could be supporting and working for the family. And this issue was compounded also by the cultural expectations, especially for girls who maybe got pregnant or were married off. So the value of finishing school was extremely low. Um, and then of, obviously there's the uncertain uh, status and potential move back to home countries or onward movement that causes a lot of dropouts um, because children are uncertain whether they can uh, get certification in their country of asylum when they move back home is that certification recognized if they haven't been to a national school system so Granting access and ensuring the completion of secondary education has been shown to have great impacts and enduring effects on societies at large. Several studies have shown that the more educated a parent is, the higher the earning potential and thus contribution towards their community. Secondary education really is a gateway to higher education and improved employment opportunities and provides a substantial incentive for improved retention and completion in primary education. Um, it also enhances refugees' self-reliance and resilience. It creates durable, long-lasting solutions because it's associated with greater economic, social, and political benefits. Um, and some of the things I've listed here as well, the access to livelihoods, because each additional year of school can raise a girl's future earning power by 12%, and that's significant. And secondary school, Therefore, for boys and girls means that likely they're able to provide a much higher uh, earning income for their families. Global poverty rates would be more than half if all adults completed secondary school and national growth rates would increase. Secondary school promotes social emotional well being, gender equality, critical thinking, conflict resolution, and it just contributes to a more peaceful society because of the skills um, that students learn while they attend secondary school. And it has long lasting intergenerational effects, which I'm sure we all know about because it reduces the rates of early pregnancy, child marriage, it lowers the risk of HIV infection, lower birth rates, child and maternal mortality and lower stunting. And it also increases the likelihood of schooling for the next generation, because if you completed school, you're likely to also send your children to school. So what do we need to do as a community working on strengthening secondary education in humanitarian contexts? So we need to advocate for the inclusion of all refugee children within the national systems, because it, and if we can support the capacity of national schools to support refugee students, this will enable their pathways to receive accredited primary and secondary school certificates, which then opens up the doors for other opportunities, such as attending technical and vocational training colleges. So not not all youth are academically oriented, but if we can open the doors to formal long term technical vocational training, we will expand their access to from learning to earning opportunities. Um, and here I really also need to point out that those short skills building opportunities are great, you know, like two weeks here, one week there, but a certified longer term training in an accredited institution will really provide that pathway to a sustainable income earning opportunity. Um, to 
two more things we can do. So we should we can fund scholarships for secondary education. So in as much as we're promoting scholarships for higher education, if we don't have people who've completed secondary school, we don't actually have a cohort. So we need to go one step lower and ensure that the talented young people in primary school don't drop out because of lack of finances. And so let's advocate for scholarships starting at secondary level. And this can be as basic as ensuring um, access to transport, scholastic materials, menstrual items for girls, uh, to full scale scholarships that cover everything. Um, and we need to, this can be done as we talk about our partnerships with private sector companies and development partners. Um, they are the ones who are supporting us in this process. And so we need to um, remember that improving enrollment rates are linked to not only financial limitation, but also improving the quality of the schools. So in as much as we're funding those scholarships, we also need to ensure we're training teachers, we're providing role female role models for girls in secondary school, that we have adequate res resources in the classroom, so that we have a quality teaching and learning environment. Um, and lastly, like really to invest in those interventions that promote equity in education, because we need to make sure that all girls, boys, those with disabilities have equal access to complete their educational journey. Um, there is definitely a need to invest more in secondary education. The Global Compact for Refugees calls for all stakeholders, so that's governments, international organizations, CSOs, donors, refugees, host communities, to work in partnership with each other so that we grant access to education for all forcibly displaced people. It's a lasting investment and, and this will ensure that we raise the capacity of refugee youth to be successful contributors to their society. So thank you. Thank you so very much, Clara. I love the way that you ended there. You know, I always love the five, right? So you talked about advocate, fund, enhance, invest, expand. Exactly. You know, it's a fantastic summary of what it is. And I love the fact that it ends with what can we do as education people? We love to do things. So how can we actually embrace that and make change? Thank you so very much for your time and for sharing with us today. So financing for secondary education seems to be one of the biggest challenges and it is much more expensive than primary education. Addressing the current gap will require sustained investment from governments and donors. So I'd like to invite uh, Fidela novak Iron, Chief of Force Displacement Response at Education Cannot Wait, what Education can, Cannot Wait is currently doing to enhance its investment in favour of secondary education. What could be done to increase the support of this sector? And Fidela, you are really, really welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me and for um, uh, giving the floor to ECW because indeed we have been looking into this this issue. I'll jump on what Clara was referring to, that commitment that we all made at the global um, the, uh, to the, the the global compact on refugees, and it was followed uh, at ECW by a commitment, a pledge made at the global forum, global refugee forum in December 2019, and I think that is. A, a way that we can actually look at how can we enhance what we're doing. So ECW committed in December 2019 to enhance its investment in um, uh, for secondary education. And from there on set a target of 20% of the children reached um, in, in its investment to be in secondary education. And I think that's, that's a really important point because Clara did mention the cost and the cost is real. Um, and I will come back to, to that as well at the end, but I believe that there is more to it than just the, that focus on the barrier that the cost represents. It, it is actually requiring a change in the way we approach our programming for education and the need for us to focus on that secondary education. And it certainly has worked in ECW, and that's that good story that I'd like to share with you. So, we're at the moment still in the middle of looking at the data. So this is why I'm not providing you with the final data. It's all interim, but we looked at our baseline pre-pledge. Uh, so we looked at 2018, 2019 ECW investments pre-pledge in secondary education. 
10% only of our children were the, the children that we supported through our investments are in were at that time in, in the multi-year resilience program in secondary education, a total of 24, around $24 million that were invested um, for, for secondary uh, education in 10 countries and only 50% of the girls. The pledge helped us focus. It helped the secretariat, its members, it's XCOM, as well as our grantees and our partners to really focus. And what we are seeing is a trend towards, indeed, that enhancement that we committed to. So, um, again, temporary uh, interim figures, but we basically seem to be trending towards that 20%. We seem to be around 18% at the moment or looking at 20, 2020 and 2021 investments. We have 61% 60 uh, 60 of girls that are targeted in secondary education. The investment has climbed up to $34 uh, million in 15 countries. So we're seeing here that actually that target and that focus, so that mindset, that, that shift in mindset that it was uh, referring to has helped us and we have some countries that have gone beyond uh, Libya, 45% uh, targeted girls, Iraq, 25% of targeted girls. So we, we have also like uh, Clara was showing a contrasted figure with numbers that are low. Indeed, we also have those, uh, those situations where we are still close to, um, you know, the three percent uh, mark but we do have those good examples and I believe that we can learn more and that's what we're working on at the moment is looking at what is it that we're investing in before I go there and this is why I believe that it's a whole package that we need to focus on and the five points by Clara were really very interesting because it, it is that holistic approach that we need to have that advocacy was uh, Clara's first point advocacy is so important um, and it is one of the, the key pillars of ECW. So when it's not just about, um, uh, about investment, it's also making sure that your advocacy, your communication is also supporting you, of course, to try and um, raise the awareness and ultimately mobilize the resources. But it also speaks to those that are most left behind in, in, in our education programming adolescents, youth, and the secondary education. So we've been looking also at how many uh, mentions we've had of secondary education, ad uh, adolescents, and youth, and it ranks third in our top messaging in ECW. So there again, you can see that that focus that the pledge gave us has also driven a focus in our advocacy communication. And just last year in 2021, we published 180 pieces on our website with one piece in particular on Afghanistan that was then that generated then over 7,000 page views on its own. What was also interesting is that there was that big focus on girls' education. I mentioned how we moved from 50% uh, of girls pre-2019 pledge to 60% girls in secondary education being targeted. Same in our, in our, uh, in our advocacy, that focus on girls uh, is very much there and has been very much related to one major investment in particular in, um, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Now, what, what is it that we're seeing when reviewing the, the investments that basically our partners, um, our grantees submit to us? And perhaps this is where we still need a bit more focus. We're seeing a lot of small interventions that are not necessarily focused on a systems approach. Um, Clara mentioned the need to budget for inclusion. Inclusion costs, of course, because you're going to be uh, putting, uh, supporting the refugee children, IDP children to join you know, the national education system in which very often they're not um, included. And that will cost. But it's also thinking of that education system. We're not seeing enough teacher training. We're not seeing enough teacher training through those certified, accredited national institutions that will enable those teachers not to do a course here and there, a few hours here and there, 
but actually really focus on those skills as teachers that they need to ensure the success of the learners at secondary um, education. So we need more of a system approach and more of a focus on those pillars. Teacher training, I mentioned that. We're not seeing enough yet accelerated learning or remedial classes to enable those left behind or those who could drop out to actually stay in, in the system and redirect them through flexible, age sensitive, as well as gender sensitive, um, accelerated learning. Um, and um, so those are things that are, and again, that goes back to my message earlier, but the ball is in our courts first and foremost, I believe, in terms of enhancing the quality of our programming for secondary education. So what else can we do? I believe targets, if our partners individually uh, actually set a target to reach um, you know, 20%, we would, we would say, we would recommend 20% of investments and targeted children um, in secondary education. It really helps focus your workforce, your partners, the people on the ground, but also that message in advocacy and communication, as well as the attention of your donors, because that is where you're telling them, focus on that and help us make it. It's a single objective that, that we can all contribute to. Budget for refugees, for IDPs, for those left behind from, edu from secondary education in crisis settings, budget for them, make sure that in your programs. And um, we will need to start working, I think, on indicators where we don't have a good set yet from what we're seeing. And that also helps, you know, measure success, but also focus, um, focus the attention of all at field level, headquarters, et cetera. So those were a few contributions and some good stories. I think that that's really important in an environment that is not so simple. Focus on cost, of course, but it's not a single barrier. And there is a lot more in the five points that Clara showed earlier uh, that I have reflected here is, uh, in, through what ECW does as a donor, I think, also show us that we can do that we have improved but that we can also do more as a as a community of practitioners thank you very much thank you so much Fidela, and thank you very much for presenting on behalf of ecw and telling us the story about what ecw is doing to support secondary education and to make it something that comes to life and it's not just something that we talk about but something that we can actually make happen as actors across the world uh, you came up again with five great terms, five great things for us to do, looking at systems, flexible pathways, focusing on quality, targets, actually coming up with a target as an organisation, and most importantly, looking at together collaboratively ways that we can measure what it is that we're trying to do. So thank you so very much and really appreciate your input today and ECW support. Right, available statistics show that girls are facing great challenges in accessing and completing secondary education, and that both COVID-19 and climate change are having a significant and negative impact on girls' enrollment. Plan International is engaged worldwide to support access to inclusive, quality education for girls. I would like to ask Antoinette Goma, Head of Programs at Plan International Zimbabwe, to give us an, an overview of Plan's approach and tell us what they are currently doing to support secondary education for girls in Zimbabwe. We really welcome you warmly, Antoinette. Thank you so very much. Thank you. So as I start my uh, presentation, I, I really would like to um, remember the girl. Um, and, and for me, uh, the girl that I met a few months ago in our informal education program, which is, um, an accelerated learning program. Her name is Chipo. She is a girl with disability who had dropped out of school uh, because of access challenges. And uh, Chipo has been accessing accelerated learning in the hope of reintegrating back into school. So, so for me, this session for me is dedicated to Chipo. 
So maybe I want to just start by painting a picture of the experiences of an average uh, adolescent girl in Zimbabwe, as, as I bring experiences from the field into this conversation. So for starters, her position and condition is already challenged. Uh, she has to contend with challenges of walking long distances to school, the pressure of household chores, the risk of teen pregnancy, all of which impact on learning uh, outcomes for her. So we've not yet factored emergencies into this equation. So what this basically means is that the hindrances multiply where there are emergencies. And for us in Zimbabwe, uh, I just want to bring in a different set of emergencies that we deal with. Often it's cyclical climate-induced food crisis and tropical cyclones. And it's, it's a reality for most of Southern and Eastern Africa. And these impact on education because uh, they result in uh, cyclical uh, periods of absence from school. And this, uh, for many girls, results in dropout. So in Zimbabwe, we have cyclical climate-induced uh, food crisis. And in the last two years, added to that is another layer of COVID-19, which also resulted in long periods of school closures. So what we see is that uh, adolescent girls um, in these kind of uh, uh, challenges marry early, suffer violence and discrimination, become pregnant, and they also adopt negative coping strategies. Uh, further, when girls are out of school, their risks increase. So they are less able to access life-saving information. They are less able to access information on sexual and reproductive health rights, uh, information around climate-induced um, uh, challenges that they may face, as well as limited psychosocial support. So the school as a protective mechanism has been taken away um, when we are in an emergency context. So even when we have alternative learning options available, as we saw during COVID-19, uh, secondary school girls can also be disadvantaged when it comes to accessing these options, as we saw during COVID-19. So secondary school girls are often uh, unable to collect learning materials. They're unable to access uh, the technology needed to stay on track. And this also often results in poor learning outcomes uh, for, for these girls. So the bigger question that uh, I'm here to really tackle is what are we doing as Plan International? And uh, I'll start off with our work as part of the larger Zimbabwe education cluster. So Plan International works with other organizations, um, which is uh, including the Ministry of Primary and Secondary Education, UN agencies, other NGOs in Zimbabwe, through the education cluster to really uh, prioritize and coordinate interventions, to engage on uh, norms and standards, to mobilize resources. And, and one of our um, donors over the years has been uh, ECW uh, to really look at how we can ensure that education continues in times of crisis, especially for girls. Secondly, through that uh, joint platform of the education cluster, we've been able to mobilize uh, the Ministry of Primary and Secondary Education through the support of UNICEF to support radio lessons. So this also enhances access to the hardest to reach girls. Radio lessons, uh, catch up programs, having teachers trained in accelerated learning. Those are some of the initiatives we were supporting as part of the broader cluster. But as Plan International, we continue to work to really strengthen social protection by providing cash transfers and educational subsidies to ensure that secondary school girls in uh, economically disadvantaged households are not uh, forced to do drop out of school uh, to engage in negative coping strategies. We also are strongly advocating for the enforcement of the re-entry policy. So Zimbabwe is a re-entry policy which allows girls that have dropped out of school as a result of pregnancy to re-enroll uh, in a conventional mainstream school. So we are really looking at how do we uh, strongly advocate for it and also address the social level barriers uh, for re-entry because this is one pathway for girls who may drop out in times of crisis. Uh, lastly, we also are uh, pursuing the community-based pathway. So community study circles, community-based learning hubs, um, where we are implementing accelerated learning programs with uh, the intention of uh, ensuring that uh, 
the, the girls in the accelerated learning program can also reintegrate into schools. And although uh, the uh, accelerated learning program is not yet accredited, the study groups are supervised by the formal schools and uh, the content aligns with the curriculum. So they also can take uh, public examinations. So I'd just like to conclude by mentioning two issues and to say that this is very much a work in progress. And uh, there's a lot that needs to be done to ensure that in such context, we continue to see uh, positive outcomes for secondary school girls. So number one, we need to continue to popularize and apply tools that aid needs assessments and analysis of secondary school girls' vulnerabilities during emergencies. So as Plan International, we have a new adolescent uh, programming toolkit, which we can use uh, to really influence that level of analysis. Number two, it is to develop systems for tracking secondary school girls' learning outcomes, particularly in emergencies. So this is to go beyond just uh, disaggregating between male and female learners, but to also look at the intersecting vulnerabilities that secondary school girls uh, actually experience and what are the resultant learning outcomes for girls in different situations. So we do have diversity of learning outcomes and we need to be able to track those. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antoinette, and very much for sharing what plans approach is in not only across the globe, but particularly giving us the example of Zimbabwe. And thank you very much for giving us a name that we can take with us today, the story of Chipo. And really great that you were able to honour her today with this story. You had five things that you also talked about, collaborating, mobilising, social protection, advocating again, strong message from all three speakers so far, and connecting girls. What an invaluable thing to do, connecting young women so that they can feel like they have a chance to not only have a voice, but to do something with it. Thank you so very much for your presentation. Secondary education is indeed a global challenge that requires the commitment of all of us, of every single actor at every single level. Since 2020, a number of organisations, including donors, INGOs and international NGOs, have joined forces to start raising awareness about secondary education. The secondary education resource collection on the INEE website that we are launching today is one of the outputs of this working group. Jesuit Refugee Service is one of the founding members of the secondary education working group. And I'd like to invite Jill Jezricki, Gender Responsive Education at JRS to give us an overview of the Secondary Education Working Group and what are the main documents that after today you can find as of now on the INEE page and collection. Thanks very much, Jill. Thank you. And greetings from the International Office of the Jesuit Refugee Service in Rome, Italy. Thanks to all for gathering today to reflect on the current trends in secondary education and how the skills that youth develop in secondary school, including critical thinking, are linked to benefits for the individual, their family, their community, and society at large. We've already heard about how the completion of secondary school is strongly associated with poverty reduction and how access to quality education Secondary education is a long-term investment in more peaceful and sustainable communities. With the gaps that we've already heard about from our speakers in the vision of this quality secondary education for every young person in mind, the Secondary Education Working Group formed to enable youth, specifically in conflict-affected settings, to learn and thrive. For youth to learn and thrive. I repeat that because in addition to my professional role, and probably like many of you, I'm a mother to a 15-year-old daughter. And enabling my daughter to access quality secondary education that allows her to learn and thrive is exactly what I want for my child. So that's, that's the young person I have in mind. And that's what the secondary education wants for youth around the globe. So to that end, the mission of the Secondary Education Working Group is to jointly mobilize governments and donors that crisis-affected and marginalized youth can enjoy their right to secondary education. Through the Secondary Education Working Group, we promote 
strategic partnerships, evidence-based solutions, and programming that transforms edu national education systems. As you've already heard, we are a multi-stakeholder group. We work on formal, and especially in this new COVID normality, flexible models of secondary education, such as the accelerated education that you've heard about already. And specifically, our focus is in low income and fragile contexts. The secondary education working group is working in four priority areas. We are working through joint advocacy efforts, through the development of a more robust evidence base, as well as through efforts to increase access and quality of secondary education. As our hostess mentioned, I will now walk you through some specific activities that we have accomplished as a secondary education working group and also activities that we're looking to accomplish in this next year. You heard that this group was formed in 2020. In spring of 2020, the Secondary Education Working Group met in person for the first and actually only time in person in Copenhagen, just as the COVID pandemic was beginning to grip Europe and then the world. And I only mention this because at the time that we were meeting, we had no idea how COVID would become the biggest disruption to education in human history and specifically how it would impact access to secondary education in conflict affected settings. Uh, so we worked virtually for the year of 2021 and some of the working groups achievements included finalizing key advocacy messages on secondary education. We've heard from our speakers about the importance of advocacy and being on using the same talking points. Uh, activities included producing an advocacy video for the International Conference on the Safe Schools Decla Declaration in Nigeria in October of 2021, and supporting the youth-led Tresform Education Network. This is the group that you heard about, uh, heard from earlier, the, the young woman from Kakuma. Our work has also included finishing a key piece of research that will be curated on the dedicated secondary education page of the INEE website that we're launching today. That piece of research is evidence on learning outcomes for adolescents in fragile contexts, a landscape analysis. And we will dive into this landscape review during today's webinar. But before we do that, I'm just gonna finish up with two small things. First, I want to ask you as a participant in today's webinar to please share key documents and research that your agency might be doing or have done that might add value to this field of work at large. In turn, we can then curate these resources on the dedicated secondary education page. So thank you in advance as we need all hands and hearts and minds on deck to ensure access to quality secondary education for marginalized youth. Finally, allow me to quickly outline a few activities of the working group for 2022 that are aligned with our priority areas of access, advocacy, evidence, and quality. So these activities will include continuing to build up evidence on topics ranging, on, uh, ranging from research on financing for secondary education to flexible models of secondary education. Um, ongoing ac advocacy activities will include empowering youth around the globe through their own voices and networks such as Transform Education and continuing to improve access and quality of secondary education uh, through the development of an open source course about gender transformative education. Um, thank you and I'll now pass you back to my colleague. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Jill, and thank you for sharing with us your story about your own daughter. As you say, the two key words for, in, for us in the working group are definitely, you know, learn and thrive. And isn't this what we want for all young people across the world is for them to learn and thrive in whatever environment they're in. Um, and once again, as well, as you said, you know, we need everybody's hands, hearts and minds in this. And if we're going to make it happen, if we're going to change that number, of 198, then we need to do it together. So uh, call to action. If you have key documents, if you have research, as Jill said, please reach out and please share them because we know there's fabulous work going on across the globe and we would love to be able to share it, celebrate it and learn from it. All right, thank you so much. Moving on, uh, as mentioned in the introduction, the second part of this section will focus on presenting the main findings of a landscape review that the working group uh, 
commissioned called Learning Outcomes for Adolescents in Fragile Contexts. It's one of the deliverables, and when we talk about education in crisis context, mostly our focus tends to be on access. And as many speakers have said today, it also needs to be about quality. We need to put it at the center. So I'd like to ask Basim Nasir, Education Specialist at UNICEF, why a stronger focus on quality is needed and what gap this landscape review is aiming to address. Basim, you are so very welcome. Hi, everyone. Hi, Therese. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, and thank you for having me. So my name is Basim Nasser. I'm an education specialist at UNICEF, uh, leading the work around uh, secondary education and skills. So I'm happy to attend the, this launching event organized by you to address the importance of quality and uh, not only access uh, in terms of the uh, context of crisis and fragility. So the first thing I want to say is uh, maybe UNICEF's approach to this, just to just to make sure that we're all aligned. So I think I think uh, you know moving moving ahead in the past few years, we've really been focused on the issue of of uh, of quality, and we realized two things: importance, getting children to learn wherever they are, regardless of how they learn, and this is why we're really focusing on this whole issue of multiple pathways to secondary education. That includes things such as accelerated learning, catch-up learning, uh, digital learning, all sorts of learning, recognizing that the, if we keep thinking about the, the secondary education in the traditional way, there is no way that we're going to achieve SDG 4. So we need to anchor all the work on secondary education within a multiple pathways context that relates it to quality learning, assessment, accreditation, good, good pedagogy, and, and all of uh, all of all of these things, and the and the second thing, basically, uh, uh, you know, that that I want to talk about is basically the whole issue of that these multiple pathways need to go beyond what we consider our uh, traditional learning metrics of uh, just reading, uh, writing, and arithmetic, which are completely foundational, essential, but need to actually develop to go beyond those to things including social emotional learning life skills transferable skills digital skills sometimes vocational skills so this is the anchor of how we view uh, 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 multiple pathways to secondary education being really able to deliver on the promise of education for young people having said this and i i had in my talking point some diagnosis of the dire situation but I think all of you did a great job of, of painting the, 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 the gloomy picture. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and talk about uh, the, the, the research that we conduct, conducted. So this uh, 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 research that, that you know, uh, we conducted uh, in cooperation with many members of this group is uh, uh, basically uh, trying to address a lack of systemic data on learning at the secondary level that will help us identify needs, support advocacy, and inform policy response in terms of quality. The lack of good data actually means that education planners are often flying blind. And we have seen that data gap uh, on learning in particularly much more acute in the context of fragility and, and emergencies and crisis. So an additional gap that we tried to address with, a, with this limited effort is that many adolescents with disabilities, especially girls, uh, remain invisible in the systemic data collection efforts. And learners with disabilities represent one of the most marginalized groups in conditions of fragility and, and crisis. Um, and they are the ones that you know face overlapping barriers to learning, including mobility, restrictions, a higher risk of abuse, gender-based violence, neglect, and long-term psychosocial trauma. So basically, you know, there is so little data out there about the, this particular sub subset of, of learners for us to, to know if, you know, if they are learning or if they, of what works for them. So finally, and to conclude, we wanna highlight or address gaps around the importance of, as I said, uh, social emotional learning or transferable skills. And I really do think these skills are particularly, I mean, not just me, the evidence shows that these skills are particularly relevant for adolescents as they prepare for increased responsibilities during adulthood, including transitions to the world of work with education systems uh, uh, which education systems are increasingly seeking to integrate them into national curriculum. So that's sort of on the plus side that we're finding that many of the education systems are actually including some of those more, uh, uh, more uh, I would say, inclusive or holistic, holistic skills. 
Before I introduce Mabrouk uh, to present the actual findings of this uh, landscape analysis, and somebody had mentioned, I think the, the speaker earlier mentioned the whole uh, notion of the multiple pathways and the alternative pathways, I want to just point your attention that in the next few weeks, we'll be launching another report on the impact of COVID on accelerated and alternative uh, uh, education programs. We also have a great resource around secondary education on the IME website that I would encourage everyone to read. So uh, I look forward to keep working with all of you and pushing this agenda forward. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me if, if there's anything uh, you wanna talk about. So without further ado, I think we have a video from Mabrouk Kabir, our lead consultant on this uh, research report that I'd like to share. All the best. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mabrouk Kabir. I'm the lead author of uh, the evidence uh, synthesis on learning for adolescents in fragile contexts. Um, of course, this was a collective effort with uh, members of the community uh, from the secondary education working group. So I uh, extend my gratitude for, to everyone for providing their inputs, their reviews and their comments. Um, and my apologies for not being able to be there in real time. Um, and so let me start by giving a little bit of context. Uh, we know that there has been global momentum on universal primary education, and this has pro provided pressure on secondary systems. Um, and while we know a little bit about what contributes to learning and what learning outcomes are at the primary, we know less about uh, that in the secondary level, particularly in, in context of fragility and emergencies. Um, so, that was sort of the motivation of the study and what we were specifically looking for was what is what is the F state of evidence on learning outcomes at a secondary level uh, with a focus on girls and adolescents in fragile contexts. Um, let me sort of start by providing a, a quick overview and the landscape. Um, we know that there is not a lot of data at the secondary level, but there has been recent efforts uh, to sort of fill that gap. Uh, and the emerging picture is quite alarming. Um, we know that six out of 10 adolescents, uh, based on uh, UNESCO data, shows that six out of 10 adolescents are unable to meet minimum proficiency requirements. The share is uh, much higher in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and in terms of fragility, this is particularly relevant because adolescent populations make up a large share of the population in, in, in uh, countries that are classified as fragile or have UN humanitarian appeals. What we do know that is adolescents in conflict affected countries are less likely to complete secondary school. Um, this is particularly relevant uh, for girls. Um, they are more likely to be the first to be pulled out of school, face limitations on movements, have unpaid caregiving responsibilities and domestic labor, and they're at increased risk of child marriage during times of emergencies. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the COVID-19 emergency the past two years, which has sort of been a shock to education systems around the world. And recent World Bank data shows that uh, at the secondary level, there has been about 85 days of loss of instruction days on average globally. Um, now, just coming to the issue of minorities, uh, sorry, uh, adolescents with disabilities, um, disability remains one of the strongest drivers of exclusion for adolescents. Um, in insecure environments, adolescents face over, overlapping barriers for learning, mobility restrictions, a high risk of abuse, gender-based violence, neglect, uh, and long-term psychosocial trauma. Um, and this is particularly relevant because the percentage of children with functional learning difficulties was, was highest in fragile countries. Um, and sort of quick, rapid learning assessments in different refugee camps have shown that children with uh, refugees with disabilities were more likely to be illiterate and uh, less likely to be enrolled in school. And when you contrast this with the fact that the returns to education are much higher for, for adolescents with disabilities, this only underscores how important uh, this agenda is. Um, what we do sort of know from research during COVID-19 and particularly the pivot towards um, online and distance learning is that it affects um, adolescents with disabilities differently. Um, what we have found is that uh, there's inequitable access to digital technologies, including internet uh, and digital devices. Um, even when the, these adolescents do have access to internet or devices, 
the ways, the usefulness of each device and how they engage with the material and content is bound by physical, cognitive, and behavioral constraints. And finally, um, online and, and remote learning and tech, ed tech driven learning modalities um, rely heavily on parental engagement and assume that caregivers are literate in, the, in that language of instruction. Um, and this basically means that uh, adolescents from marginalized or disadvantaged families um, have less opportunities to, to have parental support. Um, what we do know that is that there has been a, a range of principles called universal design for learning, which allow learners to engage with content in multiple ways, formats, and a wide variety of platforms at different uh, speeds. And, and these principles need to be integrated more thoroughly into education programming, uh, uh, particularly for adolescents with disabilities in emergencies. So with that being the context, let me just pivot quickly to what the current evidence base is and what we know. Um, let me start with the overall picture at secondary, and I'll sort of zoom into uh, the different subgroups. Um, First and foremost, uh, the caveat are hearing that while we know a lot, uh, well, while we know more about what contributes to learning at the primary level, the evidence base is smaller at the secondary level. However, we do know that um, active and engaging pedagogies have the strongest association with learning, um, pedagogies that promote problem, problem solving, cooperative learning, um, sort of work universally. Um, Second is that alleviating economic costs um, has been shown to increase both enrollment and learning, uh, things like eliminating school fees, uh, cash transfers, providing scholarships uh, have been shown to be particularly effective uh, for adolescent girls. Fi uh, third, teachers are central to any learning intervention and the evidence sort of skews towards the fact that repeated long-term and structured coaching in, in classroom coaching regimes are much more effective to build teacher capacity than one-off trainings. And finally, um, the ecosystem of school inputs, governance and management um, is essential to support uh, the instructional core of the classroom. Now, uh, coming to emergencies, fragility, um, or any situation where learning is uh, disrupted, um, for students, there's there's a couple of good lessons that have that have emerged. Um, we know that adolescents who've experienced disruption require flexible and diverse pathways to meet their distinct learning needs. Um, and even though these MFP approaches cover a range of, of different programmings in different contexts, um, for instance, they run the gamut from shorter catch-up programs to longer accelerated, accelerated education programs or transitional programs or vocational skills programs. Um, so a, a, there are a couple of common themes to programs that have been successful. First is these programs need to be uh, flexible in terms of time, location, delivery. And this helps accommodate um, adolescent girls, teen mothers, displaced learners, learners with disabilities, working learners, and sort of meets their unique needs. Uh, second is that um, it's important to establish a baseline, especially after a disruption, to identify where learners are. And it's important to target instruction and remedial measures to that uh, level of instruction. Uh, and finally, um, especially for uh, displaced learners, uh, embedding uh, curriculum and learning uh, in a to ensure that it's relevant to the cultural and socio, uh, sociocultural, sociolinguistic context of learners um, and creating pedagogies of predictability where um, that, that engage with uh, sort of so providing stability uh, has been shown to be particularly effective um, for uh, learners and, and in learners in uh, conditions of emergencies and fragility. Um, a couple of caveats. Uh, we know that um, multiple or flexible pathway programs are uh, particularly effective when they're embedded in the broader education ecosystem and have the support of national governments and are supported by the policy framework. Um, and so this is uh, a particularly relevant agenda, especially given that displacement now is a, is a protracted affair. Um, and we need to move away from this uh, temporary approach to a much more comprehensive approach. Uh, to learning and emergencies. 
Uh, quickly turning to what we know about uh, improving learning from adolescent girls. Um, although the research says that the, the, the core barriers to learning uh, are common to both uh, boys and girls, there are uh, particular um, uh, interventions that are targeted towards women that address barriers that are more pronounced or more unique to girls like adolescent childbearing or access to school. So let me split the evidence base into two broad buckets. Um, first, we have robust, robust and rigorous evidence around uh, two domains. The first is relaxing economic constraints. Um, we know that uh, things like limiting school fees, scholarships for girls, cash transfer programs, uh, and second, reducing the physical barriers to access, including increasing school supply through community-based education, building more schools, bringing the schools closer to communities, uh, and interventions around safety and security around transport um, have been shown to improve not only access, but, but have a, has a strong impact on learning, uh, both at the primary and the secondary level. Uh, the second bucket is um, where the evidence uh, is promising. Uh, we have some interventions uh, that show very promising results. Um, these include life skills, mentorships, creating safe spaces, uh, sanitation and menstrual health management, uh, providing pathways for pregnant girls to return to school after disruption. Um, what we see is that the, the evidence on academic learning outcomes is less rigorous, but there is emerging evidence on that on these interventions improving transferable and socio-emotional skills. Um, and so just on those merits, it's, it's worth investing in these programs. Um, and finally, uh, let me touch on um, the issue of education technology. Um, it became a central uh, theme during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now EdTech pay, plays a number of roles during, during emergencies. They extend contact hours. They provide self-led learning during times of disruption. They can improve the quality of instruction or promote household behavioral change. Um, and and there, we've seen a broad range of best practices emerge, uh, particularly um, during emergencies, things like low-tech solutions that leverage radio, interactive radio, uh, or use mobile phones to supplement classroom-based learning um, have been shown to improve learning outcomes, both at the primary and increasingly at the secondary level. At the secondary level, things like preloading curriculum onto tablets or phones um, that can be later accessed offline have been shown to be effective as well. Um, but also uh, we're increasingly seeing that technology can be used to improve socio-emotional and transferable skills um, and sort of facilitate um, an emphasis on STEM education uh, that enabled adolescents uh, to learn, socialize and work in digital environments. Um, but I will underscore an important caveat, um, education technology and successful deployment of ECT tech depends on a number of enabling conditions and a realistic assessment of, of availability of, of national infrastructure and household uh, assets. Um, so there's an important agenda in tailoring ed tech responses to local conditions. So finally, let me end with um, what we know and where the gaps are. Um, right off the bat at the secondary level, academic outcomes are not systematically measured or documented, um, nor are other broader measures of well-being, transferable skills, socio-emotional skills. Um, so there's basically, the, there's a need for more age-appropriate, holistic, and standardized metrics to capture higher level cognitive outcomes at the secondary level. Um, and when we come to conditions of um, basically fragility emergencies, um, the evidence based on uh, multiple and flexible pathways is, is growing, uh, but it is emergent. Uh, there's a wide variation in how enrollment, retention, transition, uh, learning outcomes are captured in these in these uh, uh, flexible programs. Um, so there is a need to sort of uh, harmonize this research agenda, create uh, standards uh, around it, uh, but also increase the rigor of, uh, of research. Uh, we need more credible uh, re and rigorous research approaches to, to be able to identify causality. Um, uh, third, there is a limited understanding of the intersection of secondary education and crisis and emergencies. Uh, and so we basically need to extend that research agenda from the primary level upwards towards the lower and upper secondary levels. Um, and finally, uh, the balance of research is, is, is 
imbalanced. Um, so there's a need to sort of move additional research um, into areas where we where we geographically uh, have been underrepresented and as well as at, at a subsector level, especially at the secondary level. So in conclusion, let me end by saying that there's a pressing need for more data, more evidence, more research at the secondary level. Uh, even though a lot of the lessons from the primary level can be transferred to the secondary level, the needs of adolescents are different. Um, and so research uh, policy and practice needs to be tailored to it. Um, one way to move forward is there's a lot of innovation and experimentation that's happening in, in, the, uh, uh, in education and, and fragile conflict affected states and, and times of emergencies. And it's important to strengthen the partnerships of, of the research and policy and, uh, uh, and practice communities there. So there is a lot of opportunity. Um, so with that being said, let me end there. I think I'm, I've went over time. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, reach out to me. My apologies once again for not being able to do this real time. Um, and I encourage you to read the paper. Um, and with that, uh, thank you very much. Um, have a great workshop. Thank you. Thanks so much to Mabruk, to Basim, all those at UNICEF and all those involved in the task team for their work on this very important piece of work. Uh, evidence is something that we know that we're going to need if we're going to make real change. And we hope that this will be just the beginning of how we can do this. Uh, finally, our sincere thanks to INEE for their collaboration in both supporting the launch of the secondary education page on the INE website. Your support is critical and deeply appreciated. Our thanks also go to each and every one of the speakers today and to all of the members of the Global Secondary Education Working Group and to UNHCR who hosts and actively supports our work. Especially we thank each and every one of you who especially is still here with us right at this moment, six minutes after time. We began this webinar today with the number 198. 198 million adolescents of lower and upper secondary school age who today at this moment are out of school. Each one of these young people have a name, a story. I invited you today to take a moment to remember the name of one of these young people. We've heard about Chippo, we've heard about Jill's daughter, and also about Hiba, a refugee living in Northeast Syria. For me, she is the reason why I joined the Global Secondary Education Working Group and why this INEE webpage and the resource collection are so very important. We encourage you to use the link, access the page, and share, share as much as you can the messages, the energy, the motivation, and the commitment. Together, I am sure we can ensure that the number of 198 becomes irrelevant in the future. Every young person, we hope, will access their right to secondary education if we all work together. Thanks very much. Have a fabulous afternoon. Really appreciate you joining us.